woodcraft, helping you make wood work. So welcome, everybody. I'm going to show you today uh, how to work with rail and style bit sets, how to set them up for height and how to get them to fit together and essentially how to make a, um, a rail and style door. It doesn't necessarily have to be a raised panel door, but uh, for some reason a lot of people are pretty confused by the bits that we use to create these doors. Um, I think mostly you look at a joint like that or a cut like that and you see how those two fit together and you, you kind of wonder how in God's name was a guy able to do that and um, it's pretty simple really um, let me get those lined up so you can see that joint there makes a nice door if you can comprehend this part so what we'll start with is showing you a simple shaker style frame door frame and essentially you cut a groove on all four of the pieces you cut a tenon or a tongue on the end of the rails the horizontal pieces and then you just put the whole thing together obviously I've already pre-glued this joint I just left this apart to show you how it goes together so you'd put a piece of quarter inch plywood in here or a solid panel or whatever you want to put inside there but essentially making the joint itself is done with two moves when you're going to do it on the router table because you could do this on the table saw as well but we're going to talk about the router table essentially all you need is is a, a slot cutting bit to cut the slot or the groove around all four pieces and then you need a, a bit that's going to leave you with that tongue. And that would basically be called uh, uh, a tongue bit, if you will, uh, in, the, in the tongue and groove set. So one would just have a single cutter with a bearing, the other would have two cutters with a bearing between them. And you'd pass that by that router bit like that, and it would just basically leave you that tongue. Real simple stuff. What what I want to show you is how to use that same kind of simple technique, if you will, to create a, a finer looking joint or a more sophisticated or fancy looking joint. It's not going in there. Like that. And it's done the same way as you do a tongue and groove joint. So you've got two cutters you're dealing with. One is going to create this profile on the edge of your wood here. So this has whatever shape you want. This particular one is OG. You'd have, a, you know, there's a bead design. This is basically a step with a bead and another step. Uh, you can get them all the way to just basically a shaker design, which is kind of just a slight angle to it. And then, of course, it has the matching cutter to match that angle. So one, one of the bits is going to cut this profile on the edge of the wood. And the other bit is going to cut this profile just on the ends of the rails. So obviously one of these bits is going to get a lot more work than the other one. Uh, the secret to cutting this particular cut is how you're going to hold the piece while you make the cut. And I mean that quite literally, how you're going to physically hold it. When you've got this set up, and I'll walk you through this in a minute step by step, but just for the explanation part of this, we'd have this bit here set up in the router table and it's going to cut this cut here, okay, that end cut or that cope cut we call it. You cannot just walk up to the router table and, and cut that like that. You're going to need something to back that up with and you could use a mortising, or I'm sorry, a, a coping sled, not a mortising sled, a coping sled and what a coping sled would do for you is essentially give you a plate about yay big, maybe 8 by 12-ish, with a fence on it that's permanently attached that's square to this outer edge here. So essentially you're just going to take your piece of wood and set it on a board that has a fence on it. And that basically increases your, your reference against the fence so that you can then run this piece by it without it kicking out or getting spun out on you. So anyway, 
the, the secret that we're going to use today is this guy. So this negates our need for a coping sled. Some of the problems with a coping sled, for one, is it usually has a runner that runs in the table. And so at that point, you could essentially do it without the fence at all. I wouldn't suggest doing that, but you could. I like setting it up with the fence. If you've got a runner in the, in the miter slot here, then it's dictating what straight is. Because, I mean, when you've got one bit sitting in here, this fence can be at any angle and it's always straight to a single point or parallel to a single point, I guess. But once you start entering a jig that's going to run in the miter slot, now that's dictating what straight is or what in line or parallel is. And so now we have to get our fence perfectly parallel with the miter slot. And we have the front and back, you know, the bit protrusion to, to build in. So that's one of the things I like the most about the miter slider is that I still only have to set up the bit protrusion as far as its height and its depth off the fence. This is always perpendicular to my fence. Even if my fence is sitting like this, I'm still perpendicular to that fence with the miter slider. This is a great piece. So I could probably just do this whole demo on this piece, but we won't. So again, the big things are the rail and style bit set, a router table, and some kind of way of making that cope cut, whether it be a coping sled or the miter slider here. In the two-piece set, one of them, like I said before, is going to cut that coping cut. You can see this is the one that made that cut. And then the other one is going to make the profile cut along the inside edge of all four pieces. Okay. When setting up for height, and this is a CMT set, it's one I've had for quite a long time. Decent set, but we carry better stuff now, so I would strongly suggest the white side, although Freud's really good stuff as well. So I'll walk you through how to set these things up because that's really the only hard part to it, and that's not even that tough. So of course, as with any router bit, I shove it in there as deep and hard as I can get it and then tighten it for all I'm worth, right? No? Oh, so I should pull it up a little bit so it doesn't bottom out. That's probably a pretty good idea, actually. For those of you that don't know, you never want to shove a router bit all the way down in as far as it can go and then tighten it. You're not giving it any room to tighten. It's got to be able to move. So always pull it up a little bit. Anybody want to hazard a guess as to which cut you should do first? This one or this one? This one. You'd want to do the end grain first because remember this router bit's going to be coming by the wood like this and it's going to cut that out of there. So the first thing you need to do is put a sacrificial piece behind it so that you don't blow this fiber out on this end. But secondly, what blowout, let's say you do get, would be down here on the end or over here. And when, when you go and run this cut, you'd then clean that little bit of tear out off as far as one on the inside. So, but again, if you use a sacrificial piece behind it and run it, you shouldn't have any tear out at all. But nonetheless, again, if you cut this one first and then come back to cut this one, you will get tear out here and there's no way to make, well, I suppose you could make a backer board, an argument could be made, but it would not be easy to make a backer board to fit this. So always do your end grain cuts first when routing on wood. So as far as setting it up height, I can cheat. I've got an, an already set or an already cut piece. I can put it right up in here. I can set the height right off of it. There it is. But what do you do if you're just setting it up for the first time? The best advice I can give you is, especially with this one, with the, the OG set like this, the design is it has a step, then the OG, 
then another step down to the slot. Okay. When you get this joint together, I'm going to jump ahead for a second to kind of explain something. You get this thing all put together and glued up. Somebody dropped that thing. It's all bent up. There we go. And it's all glued up. When you first set it up, you got this seam right here perfectly flat, okay? We all strive to get that to where we don't have any more rework. But for whatever reason, there's about maybe a 64th that just kind of floats through my shop. I don't know about yours. I'll have some where the rail's a little bit higher than the style. I'll have some where the style's a little bit higher than the rail. Just a little bit, you know, we can feel 20 thou with our finger. So the point is, you're going to come back and you're going to sand on this to get these flush. You're going to probably have a random orbit sander. This is all glued together and you're going to sand these things to get them flush. Because of that, if you don't make this first step deep enough, say you do just a very shallow cut and that first step is maybe just a 30 second or so, there's a really good chance you could sand through it when sanding that corner. And then you'd lose that profile in the corners. It would look really bad, trust me. So the first thing I like to say is I want a good eighth inch on that first step right there so that I have meat left when I'm sanding that corner that I don't sand through that first step, okay? So, when setting the bit up, I can visually see, how else would you see? Well, I can see with my eyes, I would say, that this little step at the bottom of my cut, right? When I look up underneath here, when it's set up, I can see that cutter and I can look under it, okay? And I can tell where the cutter stops and then the distance between the cutter and the table, that's how big my lip's going to be here, which of course is the same as it's going to be here, okay? So I always want at least an eighth of an inch from the bottom of that curve on the cutter to the table, and then I know that'll leave me that eighth of an inch on my profile. And that's the way I've got it set up here. A good thing to do, obviously, you've purchased this bit set or whatever, and um, or somebody gave it to you, whatever. The point is you have one of these bit sets, you set it up for the first time, make some cuts on it. When you're happy with those cuts, make a sample set, just put them up in the router table cabinet with everything else, or router bit cabinet with everything else. That way when you break it out next time, you can walk right up, set it up off of a set of setup blocks and go to work. As far as thickness of your wood, you're always gonna make both these cuts from the face so the thickness of the wood at that point really has little bearing as it doesn't have to be the same thickness as your setup blocks is what I'm trying to get at because they're always face down on the router table so if the wood was a little taller it wouldn't have much uh, bearing on it. The only thing it might affect is that if your wood is thicker than the total profile here on the router bit you might cut this slot and then notice there's a piece that actually hangs over because the cutter here wasn't thick enough. So generally about up to 7 8 most router bit sets like this will take care of it and clean up and you'll have a nice joint. Much thicker than that, you might have to take a second pass at that back side to get it cleaned up. So now that you've got the height set up, you're going to set up for the depth of cut and that's always going to be right off the bearing that's on the bit. There's a bearing on the top in this one, there's one in between those cutters on that one. What I like to do is get it close, I've got a ruler and I just push the fence back till the, till the ruler hit the bearing. I'll tighten this end. I'll use that as a pivot point. Line it up with the bearing and then just push the fence back until it makes contact with the bearing and then tighten this side. So now I'm set up for height and depth and then I want to run my coping set first, my cope cuts, my end cuts. So I can come in here like this. I would like to have a sacrificial piece behind it. Again, so that I don't have a lot of tear out back here. So I'll take a sacrificial piece, maybe a little longer than this would be better on a piece this wide, but I can set it up like this, get my joiner handle or something other than my fingers, and then I can run it through just like that. Again, I would use a piece of backer that's wider than this. It should come out at least the width of this fence, but 
I just don't have one right now. We'll say this is our backer. And then we'd run that through. Okay, so we do that, making sure that we rotate, not flip. That's a funny looking door, trust me. So you'd rotate that cut, that cut, you do all four of those. Then you're done with this cutter. Another nice little uh, tip, when you're working on your router table and you're working the uh, collet nuts here, instead of doing this, which when it breaks free, you're going to slam your knuckles or you're going to slam them into the table or something, just put them both in one hand so that you've got it set up like this, okay, and then just squeeze the two of them together. That way when they finally break free, nobody gets hurt. So now that you have this cut done, you now have a block, if you will, a setup block to help you set up the other one. It won't be as easy because you're trying to look at two similar patterns here. But if you can line up this cutter right here on top with this tongue. So what I'm doing is the, the top cutter here is going to create the slot for this tenon. So if I line those two up on the other piece to this piece, she should just go right together. Does that make sense? So again, I'm just setting it face down, putting it up against the bit, and then just trying to see that those two are at the same height. Obviously you'd have some, some test pieces, you know, some scrap that's the same thickness as the project that you're working with. Run a piece through, check it with your already cut piece, see if it's the same, make adjustments till you get them just perfect. And then it's just the repeat of the prior method. You, you're going to go off that bearing. That sets your depth for you. Pivot off that side till it stops. And there you go, you're set up for the height. Now at this point, I would always <coughs> let's see here. run a feather board and mount this into the router table here, set it up for a height oops, just slightly with, with a little bit of pressure. So there's it sitting right there. I'll usually push it down a little bit like that, tighten it, and then run that through. I'll actually put one in the front as well and then come in with, a, with this guy and I can grab this corner right here in front. So even with a feather board on the top and on the face here, I can still push that board through. So I don't have to use these to push it through and to keep it against the fence, keep it down. I can use these items so that if anything goes wrong, I don't get hurt. So <clears throat> once we've got that, we've made those four cuts. Um, basically at that point, we're done with the joinery part of things, okay? So the next step is what are you going to put inside? You can, like I said, you can either use a flat panel or you can make up a, a raised panel. And a raised panel is really simple. It's just a piece of wood and you're going to run it past a raised panel bit 